This episode is brought to you by Circle, the issuer of USDC, one of the most trusted stable coins in the digital asset industry. You'll be hearing all about them later in the show. When the kind of mania and the froth comes out of it, you look at things in a different light and you just go, it's just, not only does it not make any sense, but it never made any sense. And that's where I think we are in a lot of these things. This is not a buy the dip situation. This is a fundamental reassessment of the conditions under which you're investing. And that means that every investment you have, you have to now think, as Pip said 15 minutes ago, does that work in this new environment? It takes a long time once you've unleashed inflation forces, once you have fed those speculators at the expense of the savers, how do you calm it down? It's really hard. That's what Paul Volcker always said. He said, you can't have a little inflation because it'll be a lot. Grant, maybe we can start things off. You just wrote a great note uh, called The End of Magical Thinking. I'd like you to define uh, for the audience, what is magical thinking? And then maybe if we can wade through the example of uh, Carvana and the history of the Garcia family that you laid out so poignantly. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the idea of magical thinking for me anyway, and, and there's the, you can look up all kinds of definitions of it. But for me, it was really a, an attempt to make the point that, that for many years now, people have um, believed that things that have happened, i.e. markets just going up and up and up are for anything other than this ocean of liquidity that's been thrown at markets and zero interest rates and, um, you know, forward guidance assuring people um, that it's safe to go and borrow money for years because we're not going to raise interest rates. And so there's been this kind of, look, isn't the market great? Aren't things great? Aren't we clever? Because we're making all this money on our tech stocks. And, uh, you know, there are so many ways you can, you can frame it and so many avenues you can go down, which is the same story, whether it be crypto, whether it be meme stocks, whether it be, um, you know, fang stocks, it's everywhere, right? This idea that the world is great and we're geniuses and the markets are going up. Um, but hey, presto, right? You, you reintroduce inflation, which means that you have to take away those zero interest rates and you have to um, take away forward guidance and you tell people it's an uncertain world. And look, we've seen what happens, right? All the equity markets are down, bonds are getting crazy, all the negative interest bearing bonds have all pretty much gone away. Um, and now one by one, we're starting to see a lot of these high flying, um, high flying stocks, um, come back to earth. And that, and that really is because if you, if you reintroduce the positive cost of capital and you reintroduce, um, a sensible risk-free rate, then everyone who's got all these stocks has to start thinking in terms of options again. There, there was, you know, this whole Tina thing was very real. There is no alternative. We've got to get in the market. Um, Get all your money in, invest, stay invested, buy the dip, all this stuff. Well, you know, now you can get paid best part of 5% to sit it out. And so, you know, I gave a talk. Um, I'm in Zurich at the moment. I gave a talk this week. And, and one of the things I said to the audience was look, you know, if you've been invested in markets, you already got rich. If you've just been invested, you got rich. Now, with the reintroduction of positive rates and the reintroduction of risk free rates of, you know, close to 5%, it's time to try and think about stay rich. Uh, and if you want to stay rich, it's not a time to take a punt on high flying stocks, on crazy valuations, on the promise of future growth and future profitability. So that, that really was the, the kind of way I wanted to frame this end of magical thinking that you've got to start being pragmatic again now. And when we can dig into stuff, but, uh, you know, whenever I'm on any conversation with Pippa, I always try and shut up more than I talk. So I want to make sure that she gets a good chance to talk because she's way smarter than I'll ever be. I'm just shaking my head here, <laughs> but you know, actually, you know, what you say, it's it can it can it's so simple. When the central bank gives you free money at zero interest rates, the message is take the money and go punt it on the riskiest thing you can find because it was costless to get it, yeah. and that's what the market did. Now, if you recall, when that happened in the aftermath of the saving, of the um, financial crisis. People were like scared and they didn't want to take the free money and they were they were all trying to stay in cash. And I'm like, the whole point of this exercise is to force you out of cash. And it doesn't matter whether you buy an apartment or you buy some crypto stock. The point is the policymakers, having been one, they are trying to force you out of cash. And this is the thing about inflation. It's an acid that erodes the value of your cash. So the higher the inflation goes, the more you're forced to jump into something that runs faster than the inflation. Well, then finally, everybody made the jump, but they didn't learn the lesson that when the central bank says, okay, now stop, 
that this means all the things that were really, really risky and only possible because of this largesse are going to become unstuck. And I think this is the bit that investors kind of, they're so binary. I'm mean, either all in or all out. They can't get into this subtle space of, you know, which things only made sense, as you say, Grant, because of this, and which things actually made sense and the free money helped them and now they're up and running and they're a real deal. Like they're not everything is a hundred percent nonsense and not everything is a hundred percent making sense either. Hmm. You know, it, it strikes me that, you know, policy or uh, Pippa, it's very interesting to hear you describe that from the perspective of policymakers. Grant, I'm, I'm reminded of an early episode that you did um, the end game with Jim Grant. Uh, and he describes an experience when he was getting into the investment management business uh, in the late eighties, where people called bonds certificates of confiscation, right? And you had interest rates at 18% and still you couldn't, uh, you, know, you couldn't convince investment managers to buy bonds. So it kind of seems like it just takes a long time for the message to set in to the market, so to speak. So I'm curious right now, we're about, you know, 12 months into a hiking cycle. Uh, you know, we've been raising at successive, you know, 75 basis points each meeting. Uh, and and how much do you think markets have gotten the message, um, so to speak? Like, have we, has have the, the central banks successfully kind of turned the ship or are people still waiting to buy the dip, so to speak? Uh, look, it's a, it's a really great question, actually, Michael. Uh, but before I answer, I just want to come back to what Pip was saying there, because I think that was that was it in a nutshell. But, but you know, it's, it's such a shame that this is what we boiled this down to, is that the central banks went out and basically forced you into doing something, which, as Pip said, took a while. And eventually, investors got the message. Um, and now they're trying to force you out, um, knowing full well there's going to be a lag. Now, there was no proactivity on the part of their policy. They waited. You know, we had the transitory thing. They waited until inflation was officially out of control before doing this. And unfortunately, on the way down, you don't have the leeway you had to give investors time to get the message, right? If, if, if you, you're kind of whispering in their ear, when you begin QE and you begin zero interest rate policy, you're kind of going, look, guys, it's okay. It's like, we know you're frightened because you've just been throw eight. It's okay. Go out, go out. And people are kind of a little bit nervous, as Pip said, and eventually they get the mission to go. But when you try and flip it the other way, you're ringing the fire alarm, right? You're ringing a bell saying, get out now. Now, they don't want you to do that because that means markets crater. But that's the message they're trying to send. Hedge your risk. You know, stop taking... Don't believe we're going to be there. Don't believe we're going to jump in as soon as the market's down 10%. Things have changed. And of course, people don't believe that because they've been conditioned very deliberately not to believe that. So here we stand with everybody now focusing on when are they going to pivot. And of course, they are going to have to pivot at some point. But they're trying to send the message that it's not going to be because the market's down 20%. It's going to be because we've broken the back of inflation. And this is why we're seeing, you know, the market reaction we saw originally to that 7.7% 7, 7 CPI print. That's the market saying, aha, okay, this is what's going to cause the pivot. And I don't think it is. I think they're, they're, they've been desperately trying to send this very strong message. Um, markets aren't listening. And that's their own fault, frankly, because they've blinked so many times. You know, we had the taper tantrum. That was the first sign that markets had back in, what was it, 2013, 14? I'm forgetting that's such a long time ago, 15 maybe. Um, that was the first time markets got frightened and the Fed, the Fed blinked immediately. So it's no wonder that people are doing what they're doing. But in the meantime, there's an awful lot of damage being done to the Carvanas of this world, right, which were, were trading at ridiculous levels on, on, on stories that in the cold light of day, when you see these things fall 90%, you sit there and think, why would anybody buy this car vending machine on these valuations? because of the pandemic and the price of used cars. Why would anyone do that? And the answer is, of course, they wouldn't if they weren't involved in a little bit of magical thinking, thinking, well, this is great. And, you know, in the piece I wrote, I went through and used Bailey Gifford as an example. Um, and that's not to pick on Bailey Gifford. You know, they, they've got a, a, a history going back over 100 years. They're a Scottish investment management firm, and you don't, you don't get many more parsimonious outfits than them. But they piled into Carvana as the father of the founder, um, a man with, let's call it a dubious uh, track record, was cashing out $3.6 billion of stock. And yet you've got this Scottish investment management outfit buying the shares hand over fist, 
And if you go onto their website, as I did, and you find out their investment case for it, um, it's basically parroting what the company has said. It's a trillion dollar opportunity. And we aim to get 20% of the used car market. Well, okay, great. Doesn't mean you're going to get it. In fact, the odds are heavily against you getting it. Um, but all the time you could borrow more money and issue more shares and do all the things that they did to, to keep the game going, you can you can make an excuse for it. But now in the cold light of day, you just go, what were you thinking? And I and I I go back to this famous Scott McNeely piece, you know, after Sun Microsystems and the dot com boom. And, you know, Scott, after the thing had, had completely bust and gone from I forget what the numbers were, but you know, it fallen ninety odd percent. He talked to some analysts and he talked about um the valuation and he went through he said look you know at the time you were buying my stock i, I, I forget the quote in fact I, you know what, i can pull it up because I, I i sent it to someone recently when i wrote the piece oh let me find this for you because it's worth reading out verbatim uh where is it hold on here we go this is what we nearly said he said at 10 times revenues to give you a 10-year payback i have to pay you a hundred percent of revenues for 10 straight years of dividends that assumes i can get that by my shareholders that assumes i have zero cost of goods sold which is very hard for a computer company that assumes zero expenses, which is really hard with 39,000 employees. That assumes you pay no taxes on your dividends, which is kind of illegal. And that assumes with zero R&D for the next 10 years, I can maintain the current run rate. Now, having done that, would any of you like to buy my stock at $64? Do you realize how ridiculous those basic assumptions are? You don't need any transparency. You don't need any footnotes. What were you thinking? And that's what happens when, when the kind of mania and the froth comes out of it. You look at things in a different light and you just go, it's just not only does it not make any sense, but it never made any sense. And that's where I think we are in a lot of these things. You know, before we get into the details of two of Carvana and, you know, FTX as another example of this, the thing is, if we step back, central banks traditionally talk about price stability for a reason. If they start to weigh in more on behalf of either the speculators or the savers, they tipped the balance. And what happened in recent decades was every time there was a problem in the system, they came in to the rescue of the speculators. And this is where I think things started to go awry. They lost sight of price stability, which is meant to balance the interests of these opposing forces in society. And they also came to believe that they had a degree of control that they never had. And I think for me, this is particularly galling and, and Grant knows very well. You know, I started saying inflation is coming back in about, I don't know, it was soon after the financial crisis. I'm like, they baked it in. It's done deal. By 2011, you could see the beginning signs of inflation moving from roughly zero in the United States upward. And it moved to like 2%. And nobody cared because they're like, oh, it's inside the Fed's target. Yeah, but for a poor family or for a pension fund, that is a dramatic change in the asset allocation or in the ability to buy fresh food. And it began this process where we were ignoring the real impact of a small amount of inflation. And then we went a bit further and then we happened to find ourselves in a war where the Russians decided to use food and energy prices as the weapon, which our military is not really constructed to do. They understand how tanks create damage, don't really understand how food and energy prices create damage. They're just not trained to think that way. So I get really annoyed now when people are like, well, you called it way too early. And I'm like, only if I were a trader, but if I'm a central bank, it's like trying to navigate a massive ship over an open ocean. You have to start turning that ship much earlier. And I think that's where things went wrong is they thought they were some kind of speedboat and could turn this thing on a dime and didn't understand. It takes a long time once you've unleashed inflation forces, once you have fed those speculators at the expense of the savers. How do you calm it down? It's really hard. That's what Paul Volcker always said. He said, you can't have a little inflation because it'll be a lot. Pip, can, sorry, can, can, I just, can I just ask you, Pip? I, I didn't get into it when I was writing about this, but, but this magical thinking idea, it, it seems to me, and I'd love to hear what you think about it, but it, it does extend to politics, right? It does extend to you know, globalization and cooperation 
was ultimately magical thinking because whenever the pressure starts, domestic politics always kind of trumps international policy. So how, can I just ask you how that, because you, you talk to policymakers all the time, how, how has their line of thinking changed with the return of kind of the every man for himself approach? Well, uh, this is an interesting question. You know, everybody's turned inward. Uh, the definition of what is in the national interest has become a paramount question. You know, I remember when I wrote like in 2015 or so, and I wrote geopolitics for investors and signals. And I said, geopolitics is going to make a roaring comeback. And people were like, that's ridiculous. Geopolitics is dead. Inflation is dead. The world is wonderful. It's your magical thinking environment. And then as soon as things go awry, the first question is what's in the national interest. And in fact, for a period of time, there, nobody could define it because nobody had thought about it for so long. What's in the British national interest? What's in the French or the Chinese or the Russian or the American national interest? I mean, people are still trying to define that. But we used to think that the rising tide would lift all ships and therefore we'd all be better off if the world economy progressed well. Then it's true that when it's all progressing well, it acts, it's buoyant and it acts as a salve to any stress. But it doesn't go up permanently. And I think that's part of it too, is the, in government, your, your budget process is always based on the assumption that next year you have to have more growth and more money. And if you don't, you have to give back what government has given your department and nobody wants to give money back. So the whole system is built kind of like Wall Street. It's a permanent growth, linear, upward, exponential, you know, hockey stick that doesn't actually exist in reality. When, when that process has to reverse, which it looks like we are either on the precipice of doing or have actively already begun, what does that process kind of look like of things breaking? Uh, because, you know, you know, Grant, you, you made a really interesting point in your piece about Carvana, where, you know, it was the price of used cars was clearly at an unsustained level. The acceleration of price into used cars was clearly in an unsustainable level. And now we're starting to see all of those trends that I think everyone knew in their heart of hearts was unsustainable reverse. So I guess maybe we could, if you two could answer, what does that look like on a markets level? And then maybe Pippa, if I could lean on you a little bit more to talk about what that unfolding looks like on the geopolitical, almost even societal level. I'd love to know what your, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. I, I, and I think that part that you mentioned again there that Pippa's going to talk about is, is by far the most important as we're going to probably find out. But from, from a market standpoint, um, look, it, 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 it's really simple, right? We, we as human beings are, we really want to believe in these good stories. We are inclined for the most part to trust people. We're inclined to believe in great stories. We're inclined to believe in progress. We're inclined to believe in all these things, which is, you know, which is why skeptical buggers like me get such a hard time right? if you're a skeptic you are an outlier it's just it's not natural to be skeptical and I, and I think no one begins that way you have to kind of have as much gray hair as me and, and have <laughs> seen disappointment enough times to to be that way but you know w when you have a, an environment that we've discussed so far it's the perfect breeding ground for this kind of opportunistic um, hope-fueled idea that these companies are going to come out and, you know, this is why this is exactly why the, the total addressable market has become one of the big things that everyone wants to talk about. Right. Because when you throw a big number at it, like the total addressable market is everybody You're like, wow, that's like seven, eight, eight billion people. Man, this company is going to be great. And it, it's it's just it's not bad. It's just naive thinking. But it's perfectly human to, to, to believe in this stuff. And so I, th I think what happens when when this turns is unfortunately a lot of people lose a lot of money um unfortunately they learn a lot about human nature and in many cases they learn that people who they thought were white knights um maybe they have curly hair maybe they don't um were not everything they seem to be um and it's why these things go in waves and it's why we get the boom and the bust because human nature never changes, right? Technology changes all the time. Human nature never does. So we get these periods where um, the, 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 the ground is so fertile 
to to kind of grow this this kind of emotional attachment to stories that we've had and then reality comes back in and, and oftentimes it is uh, the rising cost of capital is, is always enough to do it and then suddenly you get this 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 crash and, and it's it's disappointment it's the end of hope it's the you know it's dreams getting dashed it's all these emotional things that that we we don't like to face and they all come on top of each other and they create this cascade um, and that's why, you know, in, in, at the end of bear markets, this is exactly why nobody wants to hear about equities. This is why nobody wants to buy a stock, because you've had every positive emotion knocked out of you by by these uh, these stocks that were going to change the world and, and, and have a, an eight billion uh, person client list and all this kind of stuff. And then you get to the point where you don't believe anybody again, you go the other way. And instead of uh believing everybody you don't believe anybody and it's perfectly natural and i think this is why um there have been plenty of us who've been warning about this stuff was going to happen because it always happens and it's it's never it's never possible to time it perfectly but you know how the movie ends right it's like you you every time you watch scarface right you know what's going to what al pacino is going to be sitting at the end with his machine gun right say hello to my little friend you know it's going to happen but you still watch the movie, right? You still enjoy the movie and all the stuff that comes before it is great. He's never walking out of there for life. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think that's where we are from a market standpoint. And, and this time around, you know, we've had the accelerant of crypto, which because there's no history in that, because there is, there hasn't been a real end of crypto narrative for people to use as a reference mm. It's prolonged the cycles. It's made the dips in many cases shorter, but it's made everybody buy into it that much more. And I think that's why the FTX debacle has shattered so many people is because you can handle the, oh, the crypto price has fallen because I can look at the price chart and go, well, it's had 80% corrections a bunch of times and we've had these big crypto winters and it's still going up. But to have a guy who had become a very positive face of the industry and the guy who was being talked about by idiots like Jim Cramer as the new JP Morgan and bailing out the white knight, all this stuff to have your faith completely ripped away in the space of 36 hours from this guy who was the paragon of virtue in that market that was supposedly the wild west. That's very, very difficult for people to deal with. So that's where I think it is from a market perspective. And I think I say that the, the, the stuff where Pippa's, um, expertise is, is unfortunately way more problematic. Well, I want to talk about love affairs and why size matters. <laughs> 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 and the reason is this, the thing about investing in the markets is it's exactly like love affairs. You can tell someone you're going out with the wrong person. You can tell them about the tulip mania. You can tell them about the crash of 29, right? You can say grandpa had a really bad experience when he tried. Right. But people have to learn these lessons for themselves, which is why we keep repeating the same mistakes in the world economy. It's, it's literally the human needs to experience this. And the reason size matters is because in capitalism, we have created this system that basically constantly calls for scaling, constantly calls for scaling. And nobody's interested in investing in a cool company that isn't going to scale, but will just be owned by a private owner and continue to make a ton of money for the private owner, which, by the way, would be the whole middle shot of Germany. It would be the backbone of the Swiss economy. It's all these companies you never heard of. They only make one thing like, I don't know, the cans for Coca-Cola. And it works, but it doesn't have this hip cool factor. And so especially when you pump the system up with a ton of cash, size really matters. And, you know, you look at Google X and they're like, forget, you know, 10% improvement. We're looking for a 10X. We're looking for a 100X, right? And so as you get more focused on this thing has to have some incredible size progression or I can't fall in love with it. This, that's why I say, I know it sounds so crazy, but literally love affairs have a lot to tell us. And size does matter in the financial markets. And these two together make this kind of toxic 
situation. And, and I'll just throw one more thought on top of that, which is throughout human history, we've basically had two core technologies that humans use to impose order on chaos. And one of them is numbers. We use the techne of math and numbers hmm. to explain what's going on. The other one is stories. It's narrative. And the thing is, when you pump the markets up with all this cash, the story can become inflamed and enlarged and people get engrossed with that incredible. That's why people just love, you know, the Steve Jobs story, the two kids in a garage and they created this global incredible thing. And uh, so this question of how do we how do we get comfortable with the story of the little entrepreneur in some local community who actually makes a really good living and supports five or six employees right because that's where most of the juice in the economy comes from anyway right it's not coming from startup land and startup land has got like a 95 percent failure rate in the best cases so I think there's something skew if with our emphasis on the numbers and away from the core story and the and the willingness to indulge in the magical thinking story, right? And mm. so there's something there. I don't know that we have to we have to work on. It's a cultural Michael, issue. All you have to do now is just just make the title of this. Um podcast why size matters with Pippa Malcolm and you're going to get a yes. lot of listeners my friend yes yes we will um so oh, gosh. I've got a I've got a question um you know on the, on that same front just about just listening to you Pippa talk about that which I I 100% agree with everything that you've said um you know there's been, there's been this conflation with we've been living in this era of extremely low interest rates and maybe that's tied to kind of the rise of venture capital and these you know internet giants and software businesses, which it seems like that's the only thing that investors have wanted exposure to for the last, you know, 20 or so years. And now it seems like there's been this kind of sort of awakening, right? At the, the end of this, this era of magical thinking, where we say, oh my God, we as America make social media companies. You know, we can't make our own PPE. Uh, you know, we are not energy independent. Uh, and I still live in a world. I want a home. I need food. I have all these things. I mean, has that attitude hit investors in general and how do you two view the you know the export of america increasingly being these maybe things that they're, they're still valuable but they're not nearly as valuable as we we had originally thought you know i think this is a really great point and you remember it was mark andreessen who gave that famous speech in i think it was 2012 um called software is eating the world and from that point Silicon Valley and all these professional investors became only interested in software and SaaS models, service software as a service models, because you could attribute a higher valuation to it than manufactured goods. You could scale it faster. The idea was you could make a piece of software and just keep selling it and selling it and selling it. At that time, nobody was too worried about the idea that you could copy that software and it wouldn't be worth anything in a week. And of course, nowadays, that's all software is, is cut and paste in the main. And AI is making it even more so. So I think that part of it was that our investment uh, allocation system got preoccupied with a magical thought, which is we don't have to touch any of the hardware and the hard stuff because we can make a ton of money just in the softer, easier stuff. Well, it's very interesting that Mark Andreessen has now done a total reverse on this and is hugely investing in manufacturing because it is true that we need real things. And also something changed along the way. And that was, it used to be that China was the cheapest place and all the manufactured goods could be made there, except a lot of problems with that. One was the quality control was pretty bad. One was the cost of bringing it back to wherever you were in the West was pretty high. And then a whole bunch of bad things happened in geopolitics from Donald Trump, you know, throwing a fit and breaking the ties to, you know, Putin throwing a fit and literally destroying the supply chains. So now we're having a kind of new version of globalization. If the old version was all the jobs went to China, the new version is all the jobs are going everywhere because we're localizing the supply chains internationally, which I actually think is not such a bad thing. We'll get a lot more competition and production and 
different ways of doing things. But I think a lot of it is based on we simple, implicit assumptions that we make, like, well, you can't invest in manufacturing. And once we made that decision, guess what? We didn't. Um, you know, you know, all of the manufacturing has to happen in China. Does it? Like, why did we make that assumption? I think we have all these implicit assumptions that get stitched into the investment process that don't, they're not sound and they don't stand. But once one of the big private equity firms start to, you know, say, this is the way we follow them. But by the way, their performance has not really been that great, right? Like, and I, this is a question I have for Grant is, you know, are we at the beginning of the repricing of all privately held assets, right? We've been in the repricing of public assets, but, you know, all the investors and the pension funds put their money into private equity, in my opinion, because it's not mark to market. So you could yeah. sit on something for five or six or seven years and claim that it was going to give you a 15% return, but you didn't have to show it. But now what's happened with the crypto crack up and with the bond market and all these things, I, the question is suddenly like, hey, what are these privately held, private equity backed assets really worth? So are we at the beginning of the unwind in the private space? Yeah, I, I just, I think, I think it started. I think, you know, Kalpas talked about this a few months ago. You know, they came out and said that they were having a revalue. They were trying to get out of a bunch of their private equity investments for that very reason. You know, and the world you described, Pip, is the world as it's been, but that at the same time that all those decisions were being made about, well, let's take everything to China, we don't have to invest in manufacturing. A lot of that was being done for two reasons. One, to try and maximize margins, and two, to minimize cost. And so once you decide that's the way you're going to go, right, we're going to try and get everything as cheap as we can to maximize our margins, then you go in that direction. Now, what the driving force is, well, we can't manufacture over there because of either supply chains or political concerns. So we are going to have to move manufacturing back, maybe not onshore, which would be the optimum, but obviously the, the difference in manufacturing cost is enormous, but we maybe bring it some of it back onshore. And some of it, but all those decisions necessarily mean higher costs, and that means inflation is more baked in. So the CPI might do what the CPI does, and the base effects come along and it knocks the CPI down, but prices are going up and they're going to stay up. And wages have gone up and they're going to stay up. And so whatever the CPI does, of course, it matters. But in the real world where people are being forced to live again after, you know, all the magical thinking goes away, the costs are higher. And, and, it, and it, you can't just ignore that because the CPI says otherwise. You know, people are going to start agitating for wages, higher wages. And we've seen this in, in all the strike actions we've seen, whether it, you know, Pippa's at ground zero of that in London. Um, you know, uh, last time I was back there, I was there for like two weeks. There were two train strikes in two weeks, it was like being back in 1980. Um, except my knees hurt a lot more now. Um, but but these changes are, are very real and they're not changes that happen and then get dealt with and they go away again. These are, these are a, a phase shift in, in the way we think about things. And Pippa's point about these private equity things, I think, is exactly right. I mean, say, Kalpa's made a, a big thing about this three or four months ago, I think, where we're selling private equity assets at low valuations. And at the time, there were people going, this is great. We can pick up some of these things. We've got a, you know, a, a stupid pension fund that wants to sell out of some of their private equity assets. This is great. We can bid them down 85 cents on the dollar and pick them up. Great. And you always get that initial, right? You always get that initial. You get the really smart money that gets out early. And the last of the, let's not call it dumb money because it's not, but the last of the less sensitive money takes that off them. And then you get past that point and that snowball starts to roll down the hill and people do start to say, well, okay, listen, we, we need to get out of some of this stuff. It's locked up, but okay, so let's go back to the private equity company and get them to bid us for it. And you know what they're going to need to be able to bid you for it? Cash. And guess what that cash is going to cost them? A lot more now. So you, you, we're, we're starting to see that period where, where all of this stuff, everybody has to take a step back and realize that the world has changed. And if you accept that the world has changed, if you just accept that we're not in Kansas anymore, then you have to rethink everything in your portfolio. It's the only sensible, smart thing to do. 
And so as soon as you start doing that, you start saying, okay, what does my bond portfolio look like in this new world if I accept that it's changed? What does my equity portfolio look like? There's a reason why the 60-40 portfolio is performed the worst it has since 1865. There's a reason for that, right, this year. Um, and that's not going away in a hurry. That's not something, this is not by the dip, right? This is not a by the dip situation. This is a fundamental reassessment of the conditions under which you're investing. And that means that every investment you have, you have to now think, as Pip said 15 minutes ago, does that work in this new environment? And the chances are it does, but probably not at the price you have it marked on your book app. And so there's a there's a period that we're going through here. Um, and I think what you've seen happen in crypto is it's like the end of every episode of Benny Hill, which anyone watching this under the age of about 40 won't remember. But they, you know, they played this yakety sax music and then they just sped the film up and the movie and everyone's running around in fast motion. And that's kind of what crypto did. The crypto thing happened so fast and you went through so many stages of grief in the space of 36 hours. And then you're standing there and he's smoldering ruins saying, well, what the hell happens now? What, what happens on this regulation? What happens to um, Grayscale? What happens to Ethereum? What happens to trust? What happens to all these things? And suddenly everybody has to start thinking in. They can't just trust the curly haired guy because he's got the new Warren Buffett. And I saw him on stage with Clinton and Blair. And I can't just trust in that anymore. I have to reevaluate. Do I trust the exchanges? And if the answer to that is no, which it, right now it probably should be, if you're smart and you are taking precautions, your answer is no. So you start withdrawing your money off the exchanges and that perpetuates the cycle. So we're, we're in the washout phase. And this is why all the people who've said over the last several years, look, you know, I've, I'm raising my allocation to cash. And people say, well, you can't have cash. I mean, inflation's coming back. And if you've got cash, you lose it out and you need to be fully invested. Guess who's going to buy all these assets? Guess who's going to buy these bonds for 15 cents on the dollar? And guess who's going to buy the equities when they puke the bed? It's the people with cash. So, you know, everybody watching this, whether they're a crypto investor or an equity market investor or a bond market investor or real estate investor, it doesn't matter what you're invested in. You need to really take an honest look in the mirror and say, first of all, what do I have? And where is it trading relative to what? the market is going to perceive its fair value to be because your fair value of it is not going to matter so much anymore, right? It's going to be revalued by the market for you. And that might mean you're stuck with that thing for a long time, or it may mean you have to panic sell it, but you have to go through the exercise. And the second question you have to ask yourself, we all do is how well equipped am I personally, emotionally, in terms of experience to invest in the markets I'm going to be have to, having to invest in for the next five years. The last five years, 10 years have been easy. Everything's gone up, right? And so I may think I'm a genius investor because I've made a load of money. I mean, you could you could have thrown a dart at a dartboard 10 years ago and, you know, chance are, unless, unless it landed in the, the space that said junior gold miners, you'd have done just fine. If it landed in that space, you've been crushed. But, um, but going forward, it's not going to be that easy. And so the first step is understanding your ability to adapt to this new environment. And, and uh, there are a lot of people who, if they're honest, are going to go, you know what? I don't really know how to do this. Um, mm. And that's going to ripple through passive investing. It's going to ripple through active managers. There's a whole lot of change coming. And, um, and I just think the idea that this is a phase and inflation is going to moderate and the Fed are going to pivot and everything's going to back up again is, is a very dangerous base case assumption. I speak to a lot of companies in both crypto and traditional finance, and as it turns out, they share a common problem. They need a one-stop shop for treasury management and fast international payments around the globe. Circles USDC is one of the most trusted and widely used stablecoins in the industry. At the time of this recording, USDC has 50 billion in circulation, one and a half million users worldwide, and is settling more than $5 trillion. That's trillion with a T worth of value. USDC has quickly become one of the easiest ways to move your money around the globe. On top of all that, Circle is building products for companies and institutions that want to adopt this technology. That means payment transactions, fraud management tools, digital asset custody, and a whole other suite of services. Here's one of my other favorite parts about Circle. They post monthly audits of their reserves, which means that I don't have to trust. I can verify that my money is safe, transparent, in a compliant manner. Helps me sleep easy at night, you know? 
As a seamless trusted digital dollar, USDC is a zero to one opportunity for the entire global financial system. And you know what? Don't trust me, you can verify. Check out their recently published Transparency Hub on the website. It's a great update to Circle's content in USDC, outlines everything from USDC weekly reserve reports, monthly attestations, and blog posts written by their exact team. Just go to circle.com backslash transparency to access it. Now, back to the show. Well, you, you sort of have the wrong lesson reinforced continuously time after time, right? I, I can kind of understand how it might happen, right? Like this whole buy the dip thing. If you literally think how conditioning and learning happens on a biological level, it, we're all Pavlov's dog to a certain degree. And every single time the bell has rung, the central banks have rewarded investors, right? So it's, it's hard not to learn that lesson of, of buy the dip. Um, you know, I, I want to get to this question of both of you have used this analogy of the entire board changing and we are, we are not gonna, we're not in Kansas anymore. The fundamental rules of the game have changed. I'd be curious to get, you know, what exactly do you mean when you say that? I can kind of parse out different parts of it, right? So maybe we're in an environment of secular inflation now. Maybe we're in an environment of a unipolar environment. Now we're in a multipolar environment where there are different supply chains and there's more friction there. You know, when we talk about this, this different game, what, what are some of the parameters? How, how exactly would you define that for, for the audience? Michael, let's, let's, take, let's take the perfect example of FTX, right? Because it's so fresh in everybody's memory. Hmm. And instead of focusing on how much money got torched or, or you know, the, the, that phenomenal um, first day filing from John J. Ray, which just blew my mind, hmm. let's step back and think about this from a, a human perspective for the people involved, right? Let's think about Temasek. Let's think about the Ontario teacher's pension fund and let's think about sequoia right now we've seen the headlines that they've all written several hundred million dollar positions down to zero because of ftx and so the story has been uh, uh temasek have dusted quarter of a billion dollars ontario teachers are 150 million dollars poorer sequoia have torched whatever they did quarter of a billion dollars look how much money's gone well, let's now take let's go inside the investment meeting next time round of Temasek or the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund or Sequoia, right? And put yourself in the position of being one of the boards that make recommendations for new investments to Temasek, or being a young guy at Sequoia who's got this great idea. And you've now got to go and sell that idea and raise capital. People are not going to go in there and go, I've just found this amazing thing. This guy's going to eat the world. They're going to be terrified because they've all seen that memo that was now deleted from the Sequoia website. And no one's going out on a limb anymore to, to push something. No one's going to put their name front and center on some unproven but potential home run idea uh, at somewhere like Sequoia. And the pension funds, who are the last people in the world who should ever have got caught up in this FTX thing, right? I mean, I've, I've, been trying to raise money from pension funds in my career. And let me tell you, it is a slog, right? It takes a long, long time. And the hoops you have to jump through and the boxes that have to be checked are extraordinary. And there's a good reason for that. This is pe teachers' pensions, right? The clue's in the name. Uh, for them to have thrown this kind of money at FTX, that's pure FOMO. That is pure FOMO. That is... Everyone's getting rich off crypto. We've got to do something. We've got to be involved in this thing. If you think that those guys are going to be in on anything that sniffs of technology and they're not going to hunker down and go back to their very thorough process of making sure if we are going to put the retirement funds of teachers at risk here, it's going to be on a safe bet because we're not going to do that again. Just those examples alone tell you that the VC sector is going to completely change the way it allocates its money. The smart ones are, and the institutional, old school, really careful money is not going to be tempted to do the next sparkly thing anymore. Just take those two examples as a way that the game has changed, and it's massive. In the middle of the hedge funds, and there are some of them who've managed to make a fortune out of this, right? Their behavior is not going to change. They're going to get more aggressive because they're going to see there are going to be, hey, we can go after Coinbase. We can go after... GBTs, you know, GBTC, there are things that we can target here that we can make money on. Their, their, their behavior is not going to change. But for investors as opposed to traders, it's all changed. This, just this FTX thing alone, never mind 
the what the fate of the fangs, right? Which was another thing that has really made people a lot of money, and they're all down seventy percent. Not not all the fangs, but all those high flying tech stocks. And then throw retail in the game. Look look at where take a look at where GameStop and AMC are now. Take a look at where those stocks are now trading. Right, uh, GameStop's not back to its lows, but AMC is. Um, so you've washed out a whole lot of retail guys who have probably also got caught up in the crypto stuff. So the retail mindset has changed. And that's three pretty big pools of capital to say, well, okay, how are they going to start thinking in the future? Oh, completely differently. So they're, they're just three really simple, straightforward answers from this week to say nothing of Pippa's world and the way policymakers think, because they have to change the way they think as well. So this is a real wake up call. And it isn't FTX that's done it, and it isn't inflation that's done it, and it isn't the central bank's response to inflation that's done it, or their lack of a pivot at this point. It's all of it. And that's why you have to understand that the whole game is different, because there isn't one trigger for this. It, it's, it's, a, it's a shifting environment that you now have to figure out how to operate in. That's not a straightforward thing to do. I think as well, there's some good things that come out of what you've described, Grant. And one of them I've written a little bit about, which is, you know, when money is free and magical thinking is rampant, everybody's looking for a magical creature called a unicorn. And then when it all reverses, what they really want is what I'd call a workhorse. And a workhorse is a company that actually generates genuine, unimpaired cash flow. Talk about old fashioned, that it really makes profits. And so what's happening is a restoration of discipline. And I think we're going to find that all these VCs are going to start to fall in love with old fashioned workhorses that probably it'll, it'll start to replicate what Henry Kravis did at the very beginning of his career, mm. which was to go into the Midwest of the United States and hang out with the family founder of these very boring but cash flow generating businesses that nobody ever heard of and slowly convince them that they shouldn't leave the company to their grandchildren who aren't interested in running it anyway, but give us the management. Let me come in and be your management team and let me begin to scale this in a way that you couldn't by yourself and then you'll get rich and we'll get rich. And, you know, people forget that Henry Kravis and KKR, they rolled their sleeves up and they lived in the middle of the country with all of these, you know, very basic workhorse type companies. It was not glamorous. It was not, you know, the image of private equity now, which is everybody swanning around in LA or San Francisco or New York in these fabulous, you know, floor to ceiling glass offices. No, this was get out there and do the work. So I think there's going to be new private equity firms or new private equity leaders who are going to exemplify exactly what happened with KKR in the early days, and there will be money for that. So it's not that the future ceases to be investable, but it is going to be invested in in a profoundly different way than before. But And I'd add, too, that, you know, there's there's always still a place again, back to stories, there's a place for truly inspiring stories. And I do think we are at a point in history where technology is moving so quickly that our capacity as a species to solve problems is at an all-time record and accelerating. And so people will be interested in, you know, ending cancer. We've literally this week, you know, my personal favorite sector that I'm making my bets on um, is space. And there we have, you know, we've just sent Artemis up. This is the beginning of humans, not just stepping on the moon, but staying on the moon and building in space. And I personally can see, you know, we're going to end up probably with having new sources of power, new sources of resources and ubiquitous global internet connectivity because we're in space and you can save a, you can literally sort out a lot of earthbound problems through space-based solutions. And yet it sounds so literally out there 
And yet, the innovation is genuine, and the money behind it is real. And we're making huge progress in a short period of time. Lots of stuff happening, by the way, in medical sciences and genetic technology as well as another frontier. So it's not that all of it ends. There will be spaces where capital will go. It's just going to be braver souls with more sophisticated understanding of the details of the reality in each of those rather than trends that people glom onto because it, their people are throwing cool parties. It, you know, so, that's such a brilliant point, both about the, the private equity, which is, which is so true, um, but also the space stuff. And if you think about the space stuff, if you want to invest in space, right, everyone's throwing money at Virgin Galactic because, oh, uh, space. You can't. You can't invest in the stuff you're talking about, really, because it's not public. And that's another thing that we're going to go back to. Not everything needs to be listed on the stock market. These are going to be great private companies. And at some point they may be listed. But, you know, if you want to invest in the space race, guess what? You need to go and find these companies in the Midwest that make that 15 special ball bearings that the space program can't do with that. Right? That's, yeah. that's yeah. how this thing used to work, right? You, just, you don't just go, oh, give me the space ETF. You go, okay, who's going who's gonna to do well out of this? So I think those are two fantastic points to make about how the gates change. You know, this is to the bottom line is investing is not an armchair exercise. People thought it was. They could just sit, you know, comfortably at home and, you know, look at a screen and figure out how to invest. Investing requires getting out there and learning a lot and seeing things and being involved. And it, it, it it's, it, there's a cost associated with being in the game. It's like trying to be in a poker game and the entry fee is 10 grand and you just got to earn it. You, you're going to have to pay it. Um, but for a long time, the entry fee was like a dollar. You know, oh. here, you can just come yeah. in and play in this game. Well, now everybody's realized these poker games will kill you. Like, you know, you better become a better poker player if you want to keep playing poker. You, we use this analogy throughout the course of this discussion to kind of talk about the unwinding of this this growth engine, right? And I think we've got a pretty solid understanding hearing from the two of you about how that might play out in markets and investor preference and that sort of thing. I'd love to know geopolitically and socially how you see this playing out, because I, I have a sense that that's ultimately the battlefield where this is going to be fought and where it's probably going to be more consequential. So... You know, both of you are seated over in Europe. This, that's kind of the first literal battlefield, so to speak. We're starting to see conflict erupt there. I'm curious to see what extent you see Europe as the canary in the coal mine. And then what are some of the broader ramifications of this unwinding or reversal in, in growth? Well, I think you're right to raise this because a lot of the reason the markets are falling apart is because the rules of the game have changed or people have realized the rules are not what they thought they were. And so think about it this way, you know, in the post-war period, the U.S. set up a bunch of rules and institutions that basically said, if you as a nation work hard and make a cool thing, you can make money and you can all do just as well as, as the United States. And yet when China presented its first global brand name, Huawei, the first thing we did was shut it down. And, and I'm not saying it wasn't warranted, right? I work in strategic security and I've been on the pretty hawkish side of that. But the reality is for them, they're like, wait, what? I thought that if we created wealth and value and we would be allowed to play. And their, the message was no. And this is something that both Putin and Xi talk a lot about is that they don't buy into the rules of the game and they're prepared to play the game now without rules. The way the Chinese refer to it as unrestricted warfare and the Russians call it unlimited warfare. But what it means is anything goes and whatever we have to do to get a bigger slice of the pie for our folks, that's what we're doing. And we don't care if it violates the rules of, you know, whatever chess game we used to be playing, because now we're in a different space where, you know, the pawns are humans. They're not chessboard pieces. So we haven't quite recognized that willingness to actually get into a real physical fistfight with loss of human life. 
because of this feeling of being locked out. So a couple things have happened. Like, what was the first thing? Um, we said we didn't like how the Russians were playing, so we cut them out of SWIFT. So then they built their own version of SWIFT. And then when Putin rolled into Ukraine, we froze the foreign exchange reserves of the central bank. And again, I'm not saying that was the wrong decision, but what message did it send to the Chinese who have been the biggest buyers of U.S. treasuries and, you know, providing Americans the ability to spend more than they earn. And of course, you go to Americans and you say, you realize that the only reason we can spend more than we earn, which we do, uh, is because the Chinese kindly lend us money to do it. And then I personally have had the conversation with members of Congress where they'll say, I don't know any people borrowing any money from the Chinese. And you're like, uh, okay. They don't really get what the current account deficit is. Um, you know, and again, it's a story, right? The story is, I don't know people borrowing from foreigners. So this can't be true, Pippa. What are you telling me? But it is true. So this picture is really important, is how will the U.S. finance its standard of living and lifestyle if the rest of the world isn't going to place their cash in our treasury market anymore because every time something goes awry, we just say, okay, that's mine now, right? It, it's, a, it's a question of the rules are not you know, so attractive. And similarly, I don't think we can create a world where we cancel China, where we literally say, yeah, you just can't play in the game. We're, or even Russia, where you just say, you're cut off, we're not gonna allow you to make any revenue you can't say to a billion Chinese people, I'm sorry, but you're not allowed into this game, right? It, you can't. So we've got to get to a place where we can come up with a system, just like we did at the end of World War II, that genuinely inspires the belief that the citizens of all these different places can have a better future. And I don't know how we get there, but in the old days, we had diplomats, and they, this was their whole job. And I love the quote from Otto von Bismarck, who knew more about diplomacy than I think anyone alive today knows. And he said, diplomacy is the art of building ladders that others can, to let others climb down. And we don't even think that way. We're just all into revenge and retribution. And so, you know, we got to get to a place where we say we may not like the leader of Russia, but the Russian people need to be part of the world economy. And frankly, there are a lot of brilliant Russians. So uh, for me, the geopolitics, I'll know that it's starting to be less of a stress when we literally start to see the Russian ballerinas on the New York City stages, which is where they should be, right? Talented, gifted people shouldn't be excluded from their work because somebody is in charge that we don't like. Heck, I, as an American, I would not like to be held accountable for either the current president or the previous one, right? I wouldn't want people saying, but we're not gonna have you speak because we don't like the president of the United States. Okay, then I'm really in trouble. Like, what am I gonna do? And you're just gonna push all these people into organized crime and to un black market activities, and then you just increase the power base for exactly what we don't like. You know, it's it's funny to hear you describe that game that's being played uh, globally, and where I think you could make the same comparison, ultimately, even within the United States of people saying, hey, you need to have a future, right? And you kind of see this dynamic play out in between these sort of elite West Coast uh, population hubs and the Midwest, you know, where I think for a long time, people said, hey, these gripes that you have or these complaints these aren't real complaints and other people have it worse. And it's created this enormous amount of strife internally. Brexit is the same phenomena. Yeah. yeah. You, yep. you see that play out all over. So maybe, maybe we could just end with this. I'd love to, I'd love to understand. I know predicting is hard. So maybe let's not use the word predicting, but what's the most likely way that you see this all playing out? If the future is a, a you know, distribution of different probabilities, what are the different roads that we could walk, walk down? And how do you ultimately see some of these challenges and problems playing out, both domestically and internally? I know it's a big question, but uh, I'll, I'll pose that to both of you. Uh, well, I, I, why don't I take the take the the first step at it? Um, it, it look, it, it's gonna it's gonna play out in a in a, in a different standard of living, right? It's, that, that's the simplest way that I can think of to, for people to conceptualize this, is that <clears throat> we in the West who have, as Pippa pointed out, 
live beyond our means for such a long time are going to have to get used to a lower standard of living. And you can see that in Europe right now with the energy crisis. Um, you know, here in Switzerland, I was listening to someone talking today about uh, a, a bill that's supposed to be proposed that will make it illegal to heat your home above. There was some argument over whether it was 17 degrees mm. or 14 degrees. And supposedly whatever the number was, was two degrees below the level that the WHO said that anyone over 65 shouldn't be allowed to stay in a room uh, below that temperature. So the very idea that the government can mandate the temperature at which you're allowed to heat your home, your own private property, and you're, if you're willing to pay the higher prices, you should be able to pay the higher prices, right? Um, that is a material change in the standard of living. If you look at what's happened in the UK recently with um, the Just Stop Oil protesters, you know, for the last 10 years, these um, uh, the eco warriors have been tolerated, right? And it's like, okay, yeah, they're, they're standing up for a better future for the kids. Now, the response to the last few weeks has been, you're stopping me getting to work and I need to do my overtime because I've got to heat my home and inflation's crippling me and I can't afford to pay my kids school fees and blah, 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 blah. So there's a very different reaction function to stresses placed upon you that were much more bearable when you could afford the lifestyle you were living. And whether that be the US as a sovereign nation unable to afford to, to borrow and spend the way it has been because of um, people have been buying the debt or whether it's some guy who can't afford to heat his home or has been told by the government how to heat his home, our standard of living here in the West is going to fall to varying degrees, whether it starts because you can't afford to buy three Starbucks a week anymore, so you cut that down to one. That is a reduction in your supposed standard of living. That's the, the, the way of life you've gotten used to and you just can't do it anymore. So that to me is is the simplest way to think about this is that the standard of living in the West and among those in the West, the standard of living of the wealthy is going to have to drop because that's the only way to raise up the standard of living of the poor. And we've gone about this where we have for such a long time and that divide has gotten so big. So if you, if you assume that that's the case, if you assume that the average standard of living is going to decline and the, the standard of the wealthy is going to have to come down to raise up the standard of the poor, that is a framework through which you can think about decisions you're going to make. It's a, it's a, it's a framework how you can think about what investments do I want to put money into, bearing in mind that the, the, the situation I've just described to you is going to be an imperative for governments. If they want to maintain social order, they are going to have to lower standards of living as gently as they can and in the right places and compensate those for whom a deteriorating standard of living from the level they're already at is going to drive them out into the streets. So that as a big picture framework is how I'm thinking of, of a very simple way in which things are going to change. Oh, so I'm going to give a kind of very different view. Mm. <laughs> of the Good. <laughs> Good. So I, I hear you. I think in the short run, there's a lot of adjustment. But one of the things about humans that is interesting is, you know, when there's hardship, they prioritize differently. And I do think the combination of COVID in conjunction with the markets falling apart is people are reprioritizing their lives and going, you know, another handbag is not making me happier. But I should invest more time and energy into my personal relationships, into doing things that I truly love. And so we're back to love is a driver, like human relationships, spending your time and energy on something that gives your, your heart joy and makes your heart sing. And I hear that from people all over the world, that this slowdown in the world economy, COVID has genuinely changed their priorities. So I think that adjustment process where we become less material and more experiential may not be so terrible or bad to go through. I also think that the severity of these things, particularly the war and its lifting inflation pressures, it is accelerating innovation like crazy. 
and we are going to come up with solutions and alternative sources of energy are going to roll out way faster than they would have otherwise. Now, yes, we're going to have a few hard winters. I'm not saying it's overnight. But I can see, you know, small nuclear, um, the mini nukes that Rolls-Royce specializes in, they can power, you know, something that's six foot by six foot by six foot can power 5,000 homes for five years. And it can't melt down because technology has changed. It's... Um, easy to see that's going to become a huge business line for Rolls-Royce and we are going to see people utilizing that. I mean, they've worked perfectly well on nuclear submarines for 50 years, mm. so there's no reason they can't. And I do think that we're going to get more imaginative about um, new sources of energy like I keep banging on about space-based solar power, but you know, with that much, with that many governments behind it and the engineers who are working on it are like, we already know it works. We just have to find a pathway to commercialization. I think it's coming. So I actually, my bet is that within a decade, we're going to be, we're going to be thinking about abundance and ubiquity of energy resources and internet connectivity in such a way that it may be a threat to capitalism itself because capitalism works because of, prices being formed based on scarcity. I don't know how this game works when you have abundance. And I really think this is like a thing to think about now. How, how will it even work if it's cheap everything everywhere? Um, so the combination of love and abundance is the message I'll leave the listeners with. There you go. And, and so you've got, you got two, two outcomes there and how we navigate from one to the other. That's the whole <laughs> ball game, right? That's mm. the whole ball game right there yeah you too i um honestly as is the result of any good conversation i almost have more questions than answers uh, moving out of this but you've given a lot of thought uh and i appreciate both your time so thank you so much for coming on the show and we'll uh we'll have to do it again soon oh if, if listeners want to find out more about you or follow your work uh which i would highly recommend but uh, everyone listening to the show doing what's the best way to do that for both of you so for me, I write on Substack, drpippa.substack.com, under Pippa's Pen and Podcast, and uh, I elaborate on all these things that we've talked about, and I'll be launching my version of podcasts in the coming year. Mm -hmm. uh, Ooh, mine's much that. easier. Grant-Williams.com. You'll find it all on there. Excellent. All right. Thank you both so much for your time. We'll have thank to you. do it again soon. Appreciate it. All right, Michael. Thank you. Pip, great right. to see you. You too. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Michael.